Spirit of the living God, we come before you, Jesus. We thank you that um, for the blood that continuously cleanses us, um, that keeps us saved, that keeps us righteous, that keeps us washed. Lord, um, man, that blood is just, has, has to be ongoing, ever flowing, never stopping because I know me and my wickedness is ongoing, never stopping. Father, we thank you for your word. And we do, as always, ask for conviction, challenge, and change. We ask, Lord, that um, every word spoken be for edification, for comfort, and for exhortation. We praise you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we are in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Um. Okay, you guys remember last week uh, we learned that the we're sons of God, that we have been made direct creations by being born again in Christ. And um, in Christ, there's neither Jew, nor Gentile, nor male, nor female, nor slave, nor free, meaning those distinctions spiritually have nothing to do with our rebirth in the spirit as children of God. So, and we learned that just because it says there's no male and female, that does not mean the alphabet community. There are still men and women on the planet that are saved. We don't change over. But spiritually speaking, there's no big me's and little days. We're all one in Christ. And we looked at uh, a pedagogos being the tutor that raised up the children in the household. And how we move from that childhood to um, adulthood in Christ. And, and that doesn't mean that once you got saved, you are now a spiritual adult that is just complete. It means that you are now complete in Christ. You guys remember all that? Yeah. Okay, so now we're picking up in Galatians 4, um, verses 1 through 7. This is called Abba Father. And, and it's just really... There's a chapter break here, but there was no chapter breaks in the letters. So this is just Paul continuing a thought. So from picking up from verse 29, he says, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. To be Abraham's seed is to be a spiritual offspring of Abraham by faith in Christ, not a biological um, Jew or any of the other children Abraham had, but spiritual children. Now I say, verse 1, that an heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Okay, so an heir is a person legally entitled to the property, to the rank, and, can, and the continuing legacy of another person when that person dies. Um, the word that's translated here um, as child is used to refer to infants, is used to refer to the spiritually immature, and it's used to speak of the unsaved who possess nothing beyond natural knowledge and natural understanding. You know, when we look at unsaved people in the world, they can go no further than human intellect, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's all these philosophies and psychologies and, you know, it's kind of like a hamster trying to find its way through a maze. 
It's how man thinks. It's going to always try to spin something to get to a different answer. And it sounds so profound, but it means nothing because it has no spiritual foundation in truth. And so this word child here is speaking of um, in the natural sense as an immature child. Now, Pedagogos was a slave in the Greek and Roman households that um, was given the job of raising the son of the family. He trained him up in everything. He took him to school, dropped him off, picked him up, grilled him on his lessons, and instilled his morals and even brought discipline. But a guardian defers in the tutor or the Pedagogos. So here we're looking at um, the child is under guardians and stewards. Um. The guardian functions in a different role within the household, and he's of a higher rank than a pedagogos. Um, the guardian is a manager. He's a steward and a supervisor over the child's overall protection and his authority, including that of the pedagogos. But stewards or governors, they differ from the guardians. So if we're looking at this as this flow of thought, Paul goes from pedagogos to tutor to guardians to stewards. Now, the stewards um, were a higher rank than the guardians. Um, they would be the highest ranking servants or slaves in the household. They were responsible for the family bookkeeping, the housekeeping, the direction of all the other servants and the overall care of the children. Now, I was trying to figure out an analogy um, for these three deferring and distinct roles because I know sometimes it makes sense to me, but maybe it's not clear to you guys, right? So, um, in the household, the pedagogos, the tutor would be like Mr. French. Okay, now if you don't know who Mr. French is, just go home and Google it, right? Now, Batman's Alfred would be like the guardian slash steward when he was a when he was a minor, when he was a child. But then in the steward, and, and when I'm looking closer at the steward, in Daryl's mind, another household role came to mind. And for the steward, what came to mind was the mama. Daddy may be head of the household. But mama is the neck who rules the home. She rules the daddy's budget. She tells him when and how long and where he can go hang out with the boys. She rules the kids' lives. And when a kid says, I want to speak to the supervisor, that's just another way of saying, I want to speak to mom. Mom is the boss and everybody else just gets to live here. Hopefully not incurring her wrath. Yeah. So that is how my brain came up with the steward. Anyway. He was Alfred. So whether the father was a dead or alive in the household, um, and whether the kid was an orphan or still had both parents, stewards and guardians raised up the son and cared for the estate until he was of legal age to have authority over his own affairs. Now, the Romans deferred from the Greeks and the Jews when it came to the rite of passage that declared a, that a boy was now a man. Um, the Greeks determined it, it was at the age of 18. The Jews determined it was at the age of 12, 13, when, when a boy was bar mitzvah. But for the Romans, there was no set age limit. Um, a boy's manhood was determined when the father had examined him and decided and deemed that his son was now mature enough to be called a man. It was then that he had his toga party as public confirmation of his adoption and his rite of passage as a son. Mm -hmm. Then the son took off those common garments of children, slaves, or servants, 
and put on his toga of adulthood. So we can look at it like this. This is saying, um, even though Baron Trump is heir to the Trump empire, when he was a little child, because now he's grown, I don't know what he does now, but when he was a little kid, he couldn't sign checks. He couldn't go take the Ferrari for a spin or go fly off in one of the private jets. He was under the care and authority of his nannies, tutors, and butlers. But the day will come when Baron has full authority over his affairs and when he receives his portion as heir to the Trump empire. All right. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So verse three says, even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. OK, so now Paul is taking this well-known natural system of adoption and sonship and laying it down side by side as it applies to our spiritual condition before getting saved and our spiritual position after getting saved. Now, remember that word child could refer to an unbeliever, a spiritually immature person, or just a, a small child. We're looking at it here in this context as an unbeliever. It says, even so, when we were children, that is unbelievers, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Um, so we have to remember this, that we have to accept this reality. Before any of us were saved, we were not children of God. We were all creations of God. But before accepting Jesus, you and I were simply children of the devil. And this is something hard for people to get grasp. They, they, oh, we're all children of God. No, we're not. We're all creations of God. But you don't become a child of God until you accept Jesus. So if your parents, your children, or whoever you love most does not have Jesus, and you do, you have two different fathers. So before getting saved, Paul is saying, as children of the devil, we were just like minor children and infants and grown people too immature to be considered adults. Therefore, we were slaves and in bondage to the elements of the world. Um, this elements of the world is it's a, it's a unique Greek word, and it basically means the basic principles of things the unsaved people of the world are bound to. Mm. Basically, it's the best the man of the world can come up with. Mm. But check this out. The whole world is under the sway of the devil. Mm -hmm. So those who are of the world are in rank, in single file line, marching according to the devil's directions. Mm. But we are not of the world even though we are in it. In Christ, we have been supernaturally delivered by the grace of God, born again to maturity, meaning saved as opposed to unsaved. And we've been set free of all that's in this world. That is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Before coming to Christ by faith, everybody was under bondage. To the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The Jews were in bondage to the Mosaic law and the man-made traditions of Judaism. And there was those were things they took pride in. But Colossians 2:20 20 and 20 through 22 states, therefore, if you die with Christ from the basic principles, that is the elements of the world. Why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things that perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. In other words, you can go through these religious rituals, but they're just according to the traditions and principles of man because they do not set you free from the law of sin. And as Gentiles, we were held captive to human philosophies, uh, which many people believe to be the highest pinnacle of intellect. Um, 
It's just man-made, demonically inspired religion and superstitions. And those are things which we also took pride in. People will say, well, I'm an expert in this field, therefore, dot, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And I know a long time ago, there was some guy named Dr. Spock who said, you should never be mean to your children. You should not spank them. You should blah, blah, blah. And then you got a bunch of crazies running around. And when he was old, he said, I was wrong. <laughs> you got a bunch of experts today that want to tell you that your little boy can be a little girl because he put on his sister's shoes. No, you take off your sister's shoes and go take this dump truck and go get dirty. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Colossians 2.8 declares, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead, the fullness of deity, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In other words, it's saying, listen, man is clever. He's so smart, he lies to himself and believes it. But that's not according to Christ. Christ gives you the solid answer. So Paul, in this statement, was including both Jews and Gentiles in this. See, when it comes to God, there are only two ways to approach him. And they're each by an act of faith. The first way is by faith in who God is and what God has said and what he alone has done. The other approach is by faith in one's own abilities. What a person has deemed to be acceptable based on who they are and their own best efforts, their own best intents, and their own best deeds. If we go back to Genesis 4, remember Cain and Abel both came worshiping. Cain came by faith in his own way, but Abel came by faith in the Lord in God's way. The scripture states in Genesis 4, 4, and 5, the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. When man comes to God on his own and says, I've achieved it, I've done it, and you should be glad to get what I'm giving you. And God says, I don't have respect for that. Man gets angry. What you mean, my best is not enough. I'm a good person. I did better than they did. But it's not good enough. Hebrews 11.4 states this. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. It was by faith in God. Through which he attained the witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and though he being dead, he still speaks. Having faith in God alone and accepting that we are received by him simply by his grace and not of any works of our own righteousness is an insult to man's pride. Most people reject God because they don't believe they're bad enough. They believe they're good enough to get there without him. And so they reject him. But when you come to that point and realize who you truly are, you understand you are in the middle of the ocean drowning, right? right. And there's sharks coming. And the only thing being tossed to you is a pink life preserver with sparkles. <laughs> now, you can say, I don't like pink and sparkles and drown. Or you can take the only thing the Lord has offered. Cain came his own way. 
And this causes people to be angry with the Lord because he does not recognize our very best human efforts as anything more than filthy rags. Colossians 2.23 says, All these things that you do have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion and false humility and neglect of the body, but they are no value against the indulgence of the flesh. In other words, you can do all these things externally, but it's not going to help you with what you struggle with internally. You know, it's being a Christian that we have this struggle. Mm -hmm. In the world, you can behave properly and be accepted, right? And you can compartmentalize your life, what I do over here, I don't do over there, and that's quite all right. But when you're walking with God, you realize that doesn't work. It doesn't matter what I'm doing out here if my heart is over there. Another version uh, words Colossians 2.23 like this. These rules seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, meaning self-imposed worship, and severe body discipline. But they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Uh, we got these um, new air fresheners. Okay, I'm going to tell you how we got them. Here's my confession. I had a doctor's appointment and went to the bathroom at Kaiser, and it smelled really good. And I was like, where is that coming from? And I saw the little air freshener there. And I was like, okay, that's cool. And then when I turned around and washed my hands, there was two more. And I was like, they got three in here. I could put one in my pocket. <laughs> I'm like, I'm about to steal the air freshener and go have my my appointment with the doctor smelling like air freshener. <laughs> so I had to look it up on Google and told Tina. And she said, yeah, we can't have the pastor stealing. So. <laughs> but that was my evil desire. I'm going to steal the air freshener. I'm not, I don't even steal. But I was going to steal a loud smelling air freshener and then go into my doctor's appointment. So when we were unsaved, we were in bondage under the basic principles of the world. Rather, it was in the Jewish system or the Gentile system. We were still led by the basic principles of the unsaved world. Verse 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Okay, so we're going to have to break this down in pieces because it's, it's a lot, but the fullness of time for Jesus to come happened in history according to God's perfect plan. After the northern kingdom of Israel was carried away by the Syrians in 722 B.C. and the southern kingdom of Judah was carried away by the Babylonians in 586 B.C., the children of Israel were scattered throughout different empires as one conquered another. Okay, the Syrians were conquered by the Babylonians. The Babylonians were conquered by the Medes and the Persians. The Persians were conquered by Alexander the Great and the Greeks. And finally, the Greeks were conquered by the Romans. Mm -hmm. Each succeeding empire was larger than the one before it. With the Jews scattered throughout all these empires, they had all lost speaking Hebrew. Mm -hmm. They spoke Aramaic or whatever language um, was in the land that they were in, right? Because, you know, when these empires spread, they just conquered nations and absorbed them into the empire, right? So wherever the Jews were throughout these empires, 
they were speaking the native language of that land. Um, so all these nations and all these Gentiles, they worship multiple gods, but the Jews worship Yahweh alone. And they had some impact amongst the people where they live because they're like, you strange people only have one God, but you're kind of moral and you don't do these things and you don't do these things. So they had, they were, the Jews had influence wherever they were, scattered throughout these empires. However, when Alexander ruled the world, he made Greek the common language spoken by everyone in his empire. So now, throughout the whole Greek empire, there was at least two languages spoken, the people's native language and common Greek, right? Now, when it comes to the Greek language, it's the most precise language ever spoken. And in Alexander's empire, the entire empire spoke it. When I say precise, I mean they have a word for kind of like everything, right? And they have a, a inflection of male, female, neuter. I mean, it's just really precise. Well, Alexander's empire stretched from India across the Middle East to Northern Africa, Egypt, almost down to Ethiopia. Well, it was during the reign of the Greek empire that the Jewish priests and scholars translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. Now everybody in the world or everybody in the empire could read the Bible and learn about the God of Israel. So not only did the Jews living amongst them have influence, now the whole world had the Jewish scriptures. When the Romans conquered the Greeks, the Romans built roads all over the empire and brought peace and safety when people traveled, be it on land or sea. I mean, they smashed the pirates. They put the in any feuding between tribes, families. It's like there's going to be peace. They call it Pax Romana, Pax Romana, which means Roman peace, meaning you will behave or you get crushed. But they kept the Greek language. And so even in the Roman Empire, everybody spoke Greek. And it was precisely at this time in history when Jesus came. The one God, the moral God of the Jews, already had influence now amongst the Gentiles. But now the gospel of Jesus Christ was being spread everywhere in the Roman Empire, carried on these roads, and the New Testament was written in Greek. So the whole world could read it. This was the fullness of time for Jesus Christ and the gospel message. Furthermore, on a spiritual level, when Jesus stepped into the world as a human, he brought forth the fullness of time. For example, Jesus said, do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. That's the fullness of time, both naturally and spiritually. God brought forth his son. And so it says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Now, we know that Jesus is eternally God the son. But there are some people that believe that Jesus is not eternally God. They deny the deity of Christ. Um, these people are not Christians because they reject the fact that Jesus is eternally God. But there are some Christians who actually believe that Jesus is eternally God, but that he was not always the eternal son of God. Now, They believe that the father, both of these groups, the unbelievers that call themselves or whatever they call themselves, people like the Mormons, Jehovah Witness, Seventh-day Adventists, whatever. 
They believe that the father is eternal. But at some point, he either created Jesus, that would fall in line with the non-Christians, like the Jehovah Witness, or that Jesus did not become the son of God until Mary got pregnant, or he became the son when he was born, or when he got baptized by John the Baptist, or possibly at some point on the cross is when Jesus became the son of God. But Jesus has always been not only eternally God, but eternally the Son of God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have always been the eternal Trinity with no beginning and no ending. In Isaiah 9.6, it states this, For unto us a child is born. That's on the human side, right? But then it goes on to say, unto us a son is given. So from heaven's side, the father gave the son from eternity. And the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So, Jesus was always the eternal son. He did not become the eternal son at some point. John 1, 3 and 13, well, 1, 1 through 3 through 14, it, it says this. In the beginning was the word, the word is Jesus, and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the glory as the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth all through the gospel jesus claimed to be god equal to the father and the holy spirit People will say, oh, Jesus never claimed to be God and said, worship me. Okay, here's the thing. They're looking for the words, I'm God, bow down, worship me. Okay, but simply by claiming to be God, I'm already saying, bow down and worship me, right? And Jesus claimed to be God all the time. In fact, that's why he was crucified. Um, In the book of John, uh, Jesus claimed to be both the eternal God and the eternal Son of God who had always existed with the Father. In John 5, 21, Jesus said, For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, in that statement, think about this. If you believe the Father is the eternal God with no beginning, no ending, right? How can you possibly honor him as anything less than the eternal God? You can't. And Jesus said, they have to honor me just as they honor the Father. Not something less than, not something different, but equal, eternally God. And in John 17, 3, Jesus said, and this is eternal life, that that they may know you. And he's praying to the Father, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Mm -hmm. He claimed to be both the eternal God, the Son, and the eternal Son of God. And in those two statements, he's saying, bow down and worship me. So, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born 
under the law. Now, this is an allusion to the virgin birth um, and the gospel first proclaimed in Genesis 3.15 when God told the devil, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Women do not have seed, only man does. But he didn't say born of man and woman. He said born of woman. And Lord, the Lord confirmed the virgin birth in Isaiah 7, 14, stating, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus was born into the world as the perfect man living under the law of Moses and the overall law of God that was placed upon all mankind and he came into a world of sin yet he kept every single law perfectly without sin or sin so why did the father send forth his son verse 5 tells us to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons all of that, God the Son being sent by God the Father to earth under the law through a virgin to live perfectly and sinless and die for our sins. Why did God do that? To redeem us who were under the law that we might receive adoptions as sons. Amen. Now remember this word redeem, it means more than simply purchase. It means bought and paid for solely for setting one free of slavery and bondage. Hallelujah. We were all guilty of sin and slaves to it with no way out from being under its bondage and the law's curse of death, which meant eternal separation from God as the penalty for violating the law. But Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us so that those of us who believe in him could receive from the father the full rights of a, as an adopted child of God. And doing this, the Lord did some pretty mind-blowing things. And really, without faith, it's beyond comprehension. On one end, the Lord purchased us out of our slavery to sin and deserve bondage to the um, to the law's curse of death. On the other end, he purchased us with his own blood for the purpose of setting us free. The guilty. He set us free. Amen. But he did it to make us sons and daughters of God. Amen. See, we're more than just freed slaves, we're now princes and princesses of our father, the king. Amen. See, it's one thing to say, okay, you're a slave. I'm going to purchase you, not so that you could be my slave, but so that you can be free. That's one thing. But it's a whole other thing that says, you're a slave. I'm going to purchase you to make you my child. Wow. Amen. That's a whole different level, yeah, right? I mean, I'll just be happy to be free. Right. <laughs> and I don't know, every time I think about this, I always think about that movie, Trading Places. If you guys don't know that movie, oh, yeah. you know, just for those who don't, it's Eddie Murphy. He was a, a, a scamming, homeless bum, living on the street corner, begging for change, pretending he couldn't walk when he really could. And these two super rich elite guys were like, they took a bet that says we can change him by giving him everything. And they made this bet. And so they stole this other man's whole inheritance, property and everything, and gave it to Eddie Murphy. And he, they brought him to his new house. And he's walking around in a new house. And they're like, oh, this is yours. And he's like, oh, this is mine, huh? And he's stuffing stuff and stealing. And this is mine, huh? Right? Okay, he had been made 
the adopted son, the heir. It's all yours. But he still had the old mindset and was still in stuff. And it took time for him to realize that he had been adopted as a son. And that's how we are. It's like, okay, God says you are no longer outside. You are now inside. You are no longer a slave. You're not just set free. You are a full heir and all this is yours. But I'm still acting like the heathen that I was. Well, Romans 8.3 states this. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. Mm -hmm. And he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. In other words, the law cannot save us because the law does not give us the power not to sin. The law only shows you what your sin is, right? I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be good. That's the law. But Jesus came because we could not keep the law to do what we cannot what we will not do for ourselves. Mm -hmm. David Guzik wrote, because Jesus is God, he has the power and the resources to redeem us. Because Jesus is man, he has the right and the ability to redeem us. Mm -hmm. He came to purchase us out of the slave market from our bondage to sin and the elements of the world. And I'll add with that, not just purchase us to free us from our slavery, but to make us sons and daughters, and alphabet people that get saved. Verse 6 says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Oh. All right, so this word Abba is Aramaic and the Bible translators, for some reason, thought translating this word into English would be just too disrespectful. Mm. So they kept it in its original language. Abba is a word of the deepest intimacy and personal, direct, face-to-face -face closeness that a child has with their father. Abba means daddy, but more precisely, Abba means my daddy. Mm. Now, I don't know why some people think it's crossing the line and improper to approach God calling him my daddy when the Holy Spirit put it in writing right there for us to do so. It just, to, to me, it baffles me. Now you're more holier than, holier than the word. The scripture states, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. The Lord said, I put my spirit in you to bring us together in the closest intimate relationship possible between you, my created and adopted child and myself. Therefore, come to me boldly, crying, my daddy, my daddy. Now, okay, so some of us may not have been good fathers. Other of us have been terrible fathers. However, we cannot allow our human experiences and relationships with fallen people to dictate to us that the Lord is like sinful man. Psalms 103, 13 says, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities, meaning loving deeply with compassion and tender mercies, those who fear him, for he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. God looks at us like, of course you were going to do that, you're dust. 
As fallen people, we cannot let our failures and our worst moments dictate to us the Lord's attitude towards us. He loved us all at our worst and died to save us. So how much more does he continue to keep loving us when we fail? From before creation, the Lord knew the depths of our hearts and he still loves us the same unwavering so. Therefore, Hebrews 4, 16 commands, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, not whispering, but crying out, my daddy, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. It's when you mess up that you run to God. Screaming, my daddy. Romans 8, 9, 15 through 17 says, Now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. God says, I didn't give you a spirit to fear me. I gave you the spirit to run boldly to me. And it says the spirit himself bears, spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. We are joint heirs with Christ, adopted sons and daughters of God. But. It's very important to understand that although we are now filled with the Holy Spirit and have been made sons and daughters of God, it does not mean that we are equal to Christ Jesus, the Son of God. We do not possess divine powers. Okay? The prosperity doctrine and the prosperity teachers have a false doctrine and a false gospel that says because I am saved and I'm a child of God, it makes me a little God who can speak things into existence just like Jesus. God said, let there be light. So I can say, let there be my private jet. They say, by faith, all I have to do is name it and claim it, grab it and blab it. And by my words of faith, God has to move to make me happy healthy, and wealthy. But then they say, if you are not healed and you are not rich, it's because you don't have enough faith. That's a false doctrine. Our sonship is based on who we are in Jesus. But there's important distinctions between our sonship and Jesus' sonship. He is the only begotten son, making him the son of God, by his divine nature. We are adopted sons and daughters of God as creations bought by a legal degree of the blood of Christ. Does that make sense? Yeah. Verse 7 says, Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Okay, so sons are never slaves. Um, and slaves are never sons in a father's house. Jesus, in the parable of the prodigal son, demonstrated this because when the lost son determined to come back to his father as a slave, the father refused and would only receive him as his son. We have an inheritance of all the father's blessings as his children. He keeps us when we do not or will not keep ourselves. First Peter 3, 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. And then here's a key. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. So your inheritance is reserved for you in heaven and you are kept by the power of God. That word kept is a military term. It basically means um, if there was a city under siege, the military stood outside or stood inside the city, right? Keeping the opposing army out, but also keeping the terrified citizens in because the pressure is so great. They just figure I might as well escape and go to the enemy, right? But this word kept means the citizens are kept safe within the city from themselves and kept safe from the enemy without. So God keeps us and preserves us for our inheritance that's reserved for you in heaven. Because if he didn't keep us, we'd lose it. Psalms 145, 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will hear their cry and save them. Okay, so imagine little children running with their arms up screaming, Daddy, 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 right? when they're happy to see him because he's been gone or wherever, right? Imagine a kid who's hurt or afraid saying, daddy, daddy. Now imagine a little kid who's been bad. He knows he's busted. He knows he's in big trouble. He comes to the father and confesses because he can't hide. And he's standing there waiting for the father to unleash the Kraken. But instead, his father picks him up in his bosom and squeezes him tight with the deepest love. And a child just melts in the father's arms, crying, my daddy. That bad child is me. Perhaps that bad child is you. But our God says, my grace and my love are bigger than you and your sin. So melt in my arms as the spirit of Christ within you cries out, Abba, Father. Amen. Amen. <sighs> Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you brought the intimacy, the closeness, the incomprehensible relationship of oneness between you and me you and us and we can cry out my daddy my daddy face to face with boldness be it our best or our worst and our best is probably our worst because then we think we don't we deserve it lord we we praise you that you came not only to set us free from our slavery, but to make us sons and daughters. We glorify you and we praise you. And for the believers who have been struggling with the uh, grace and love of God for you, know that his love for you is not based on you, what you've done. It's based on him, who he is and all that he's done. And if you're outside of knowing Jesus and you know you want this love and this salvation, now just say this prayer with me. 
Uh, Jesus, I believe you are God in the flesh. I believe you came to earth to die for my sins. Forgive me, for I am a sinner, and I accept your gift of salvation. I thank you for making me your child. And if you said that prayer, you are now a child of God. And there's a party going on for you in heaven. Lord, we uh, glorify you. We ask that you just place your hand upon uh, Israel and the enemies of Israel, that you would soften their hearts and bring them to repentance, that you would speak to those in visions and dreams, that you would bring your children of Israel who are unbelievers to hope and salvation in Christ. We pray for all the leaders in the world who are conspiring together to cast you off and believe that they can have their own way. First, Lord, we pray for their salvation. And then we pray, Lord, that you frustrate and bring their plans to nothing. But that you would give us, those of us who know you, the boldness to stand and just to walk in grateful obedience. In Jesus' name, amen.